Good morning, Maytown. God bless you. Hallelujah. How are you? I hope you're well kept. I hope the presence of God is there. Get your Bibles out. Before we go to the Word today, I want to do a missions highlight. Uh, Matt Talman was here with Open Arms International, Kenya, Africa, and he stopped by, and we just had a great time. He was here at Maytown, I think, four or five years ago. Man, time flies. Anyways, um, I said, hey, being you're here, let's shoot a video, and uh, I'm going to play that now for you, and then we'll go to the Word. And then Matt's scheduled to be here um, for a whole Sunday on November 29th, the, uh, the Sunday right after the Christmas Island lighting. So that's going to be a blast. And anyways, so uh, we're just going to run this video, and then uh, we'll get to the Word. Hi, my name is Matt Tallman. Uh, my wife, Cheryl, and I serve as missionaries uh, with Open Arms International in Kenya. And uh, I'm here with Pastor George today just to briefly share with you a little bit about our ministry. I actually came to this church about four or five years ago, but our village and our, our story has grown quite a bit over the last five years. This is a a snapshot of our village right now. We have 160 children living at our village in 10 children's homes. We have a school with 300 students enrolled. We have a medical clinic, outreach center, and church. We have 52 acres of farming and agriculture. And I wanna, wanna just share with you two quick stories that give you a snapshot of what we're trying to accomplish. So the first one uh, I think I shared, um, but it just briefly, uh, uh, shows our vision of becoming a self-sustainable village. It started with a rooster 11 years ago. This picture was taken. Uh, we went and spoke in a church near our village. And when I got up to speak, I noticed there weren't just people in the room. There were sheep and goats and chickens. And, uh, and uh, I, I also, you know, it just didn't make sense to me what was happening until they took up the offering. And that's when I realized, as I saw the offering plate going around the room, there was no money in the offering, just eggs, vegetables, and chickens. And this lovely congregation absolutely insisted on giving us this rooster. We brought him back to our village, fully expecting our original children's home back then would eat him for dinner that night. But they said, no, we just built a chicken coop. We just bought layer hens. Uh, let's put the rooster in the hen house. And through unintended consequences, this rooster wound up becoming the founder of our entire poultry project. Today, currently, we lay as many as 1,000 eggs a day, harvest as many as 1,000 chickens a month. It's our primary source of protein for our village, but it also inspired uh, dozens of other sustainability projects. Currently, nearly half of our general oper operating budget is produced through the excess sales uh, of our sustainability projects, and we grow 75% of our own food, which has been huge during this whole COVID crisis. And uh, we have a true vision of cell sustainability and even replicating what we've done here in other parts of East Africa. But the best part about that story is it started with one rooster from one church in rural Kenya that literally had no money, but they gave what they had and look what God did with that. Well, the second story I wanna share has to do with some of our outreach that we do in the communities surrounding us. So uh, we generally do a couple medical camps uh, every year. Uh, this one took place uh, about four years ago in a community near our village. Uh, we set up a, a, a medical tent and a prayer tent because we invite everyone to pray with us. And this, uh, this person came into the prayer tent uh, who I found out later was an elder in the Somali community. There's a refugee community of 40,000 people in this community. And he came up to me and I said, sir, would you like to pray with me? He said, no, I cannot pray with you. I'm Muslim. And he turned around, and he started walking away. And I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going home. I think he expected we would turn him away if he, re if he refused to pray. So I asked him, wait a minute, didn't you come here to see the doctor? And uh, he looked at me kind of curious, so I smiled, pointed at the medical tent, and I said, the doctor's right over there uh, if you really do want to go see him. And immediately his whole countenance changed. He grabbed my hand, he started kissing my hand and weeping, and over and over again saying thank you, because for him this was a really big deal, that we were willing to accept him unconditionally. 
And uh, in reality, that's what Jesus did with all of us. In Romans 5, 8, it says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Well, that's a beautiful story in and of itself. But that elder, uh, that elder uh, went back home after he got saw, seen by the doctor. He got treated, got some medicine. He went back home. He told all of his friends. And literally, uh, just an hour or two later, we had thousands of people lined up at our medical camp. And before the day was done, this lady wandered in to the prayer tent, assisted by someone else from the community. When I saw her, I recognized right away what was going on because she didn't have, uh, you couldn't see the pupils in her eyes. And I've seen this two dozen times in our medical camp. She had cataracts in her eyes so thick she was probably completely blind. And we don't have any eye surgery clinics in this region of Kenya. So she came up to me with her friend. I asked if I could pray with her. We bowed her heads in prayer. Uh, and when we got done praying, she opened her eyes and her eyes were perfectly clear. And she began to weep and I began to hyperventilate because my brain, uh, while my body reacted immediately, my brain hadn't quite registered yet that God had done a miracle. But at that point, it, you know, it really didn't matter anymore because everyone in this community wanted prayer now. And there were other significant miracles that happened that day, but the greatest miracle that happened was uh, the very first Somali families in that region ever said, I want to become a Christian. It's amazing what God has continued to do in that community, what God has continued to do at our village. If you want to find out more about what we're doing, you can go to openarmsinternational.org. Uh, but thanks for praying for us. Uh, thanks for uh, just encouraging us with your prayers today. Mungu awabariki. God bless all of you. Amen. All right. Open your Bibles this morning. Let's do this. Mark chapter 8. Let me just say this. Love you guys. <laughs> and uh, man, do I miss, miss the crowd being here. It's so much better to preach interactive. I love Sundays. We are doing the COVID thing here on Sundays at 1030 and uh, having a blast. So open your Bibles. Mark chapter 8. Now, I said this last Sunday. I said uh, chapter 8 was kind of this pivotal chapter because Jesus is kind of rolling out of signs and wonders and miracles and demonstrations into taking the lead. In other words, I, I shared this about the dance, you know, the uh, Jesus, when he was baptized in the Jordan back in Mark 1, he entered the dance with the Father. And I don't want to go back into that with the Bible, but here he is now. And so now Jesus is taking the lead as the Son of Man, Son of God on earth, in the dance with the Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God eternally coexistent, three persons. But here Jesus has taken the lead. Kind of this key scripture I had last Sunday was out of Mark eight thirty one, And right there he says, Jesus, after, you know, signs and wonders and miracles, said, who do you guys say I am? And they finally professed, thou art the Christ, son of the living God. Okay, good for you. Now, here's how I am going to become the king that you say you understand who I am. He said, I must suffer right he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again that must was just the driving factor of verse 31 so so what i did was when i came to mark 8 we talked about this dynamic of his deity and the healings then i jumped kind of went all the way back into verse 31 and now with those, with those bookends, the fact that we know he is the Son of God, the Christ, the Son of the living God, according to Peter's testimony, and we know his pathway to his kingship. Now what I want to do is I framed in those bookmarks, I want to back up, and I want to look at a miracle that Jesus did, another miracle in there. And I think it's going to help us understand a little more of how that all connects by having these bookends this understanding already established all right remember this jesus said this look i am the way the truth and the life in john 14 6 no one comes to the father but through me jesus said that and, and it's recorded in john but but jesus if you have a heart to, and if you have ears to hear and an and a open heart 
right through here, and we're going to see this in this story today, Jesus is, is, is giving you an entire picture of who he is. And there's some things that he does that are interesting that I want to key up on today, and I hope this will bless you. All right, look in your Bibles. Uh, let me just start reading here, Mark 8. Let me read a little bit, set the stage so that we can all get on the same page. Mark 8, 11. The Pharisees came out, began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Remember, this is right on the heels of healing the 4,000. Sign deeply. We've heard that before. Remember, he sighed deeply when he touched the man's ears in chapter 7 and, and he spit on the man's tongue and he sighed deeply. And I, I personally connected that not only to the miracle, to the person. Again, I, I, I felt it was, it was a type of sign language that he was using for the deaf, mute man. But it's also a, a connective point to the cross. He knows he's going to have to pay for these miracles. He knows that the cross is com coming. And by sign around the multitudes, it's almost like he's almost like, oh, Lord God, I hope these guys get this. Now, that's me, Pastor George. All right. Sign deeply. Verse 12, he said, why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Right. And then he says in verse 13, leaving them, he again embarked and went away to the other side. And they had forgotten to take bread bread from the feeding of the 4,000, did not have any more, did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. And he was giving orders to them saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. So they have this conversation about bread going on. Oh man, Pete, did you get the loaves? I didn't get the loaves. Andrew, I told you, you're the bread guy, right? Judas, you know how much that bread costs? We could sell that. You know how that works. All right. So typical guys arguing. Uh, verse 16, they began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. Now, just as a side note, leaven, when Jesus said, watch out, beware of the leaven, he's throwing this in as a, as, a, as a teaching point. In other words, what he's saying is, look, the leaven is the hard heart. He just said that. Do you have such a hard heart? Watch out for the hard heart influence of the Pharisees. Watch out for the leaven, he says, of Herod, literally, what would come through the scribes and the Herodians, who were, they were just scholars and lawyers who supported Herod Antipas at the time. All right. Verse 17, Jesus and Jesus aware of this said to them, why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not see or understand? There it is. Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? In other words, he's telling them, look, You've been a part of these miracles. You've seen it. You, you, you have this, this database, this precept upon precept. What's it going to take for you to get this? Now, I don't want to put my attitude or my words in the mouth of Jesus. But he goes on to say in verse 19, Look, when I broke the five loaves, how many basketfuls of broken pieces did you pick up? And they tell him, 12. Verse 20, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large basketfuls of broken fish did you pick up? They said, seven. And he said to them, do you not understand? Look, let me just stop right here. There's a lot of people out there that kind of live in what I call Graysville. They're on the perimeter. They will say the same thing. Oh, yeah, you're the Christ, the Son, the living God. But they don't get the whole pathway, the suffering Messiah. The, the penalty of our sins. In other words, if you were to say to a lot of people today, and I've, I've said it, I've experienced it over the years, you know, who do you say that Jesus is? They would just connect Jesus to some, you know, pie in the sky God that just gives them whatever they want whenever they need it. And, and they're not connected through salvation. They're not connected through that open heart receiving Christ. They have this hard heart. They just give me what I want and that's all I want. I'll come to church on Christmas, maybe Mother's Day. That's all I want. Well, that's fine. And I pray that if that's you, you have a genuine relationship with Christ. But man, uh, I just want to encourage you. You can. I'm going to show you from the teaching today. Jesus gives you everything you need right from healing someone else, right from him pouring out on someone else for you to understand who he is and why he came and to accept him as Lord and Savior. All right. Now, throughout the Gospels, um, and we looked at this, you know, we had Jesus touching ears, spitting on people here. Um, he, uh, I guess I got ahead of myself. Look at uh, 
Look at 22, Mark 22. Let me go ahead and read this for you so it sets the stage. All right. And they came to Basada, and they brought a blind man to Jesus and implored him to touch him. Here again, we have the they factor, the crowds bringing. Someone's bringing him. They implored Jesus to touch him. So Jesus, what's he do? Takes a blind man by the hand, takes him out of the village, takes him out personal. And after spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And look at what the guy says. This is Mark 8, 24. And he looked up and said, I see men. I see them like trees walking around. He again laid his hands on his eyes, and he looked intently and was restored and began to see everything. And he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. Or again, the implication is, look, just go home and rejoice. Because if you go out back to the village, there's going to be the mobs coming and they're just going to want something. They're going to want to get fed. They're going to want miracles. And I want them to get this revelation on their own. Now, what I want to do is I, I want you to just think with me and I want to try to pull something together. We had the healing uh, two weeks ago. The guy touches his ear. Jesus touches the, the deaf man's ears, spits on his tongue, lays his hands on it. Here in Mark, he spits on his eyes. Uh, they start to open. So it's a progressive healing. It's a progressive healing, and then he lays hands on him again, and then he sees clearly, looks intently, sees clearly. All right. Now, I want to connect this. I want you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 9, and I want to pull some things together here for you. So you're going to have to put your thinking cap on. I want to just stop and pray right here, okay? Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray that we will just, Holy Spirit, you said you would come and illuminate our minds, illuminate everyone listening to my voice today. Illuminate me to be able to deliver the message and others to be able to receive it as the word of God, as it's written in context in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, get ready. Are you ready? You're going to receive this. Now, um, Jesus, throughout the Bible, think of it this way. He did a lot of stuff. Um, he laid hands on some. He just commanded others, just go. I mean, these are, this is the situation for healings. Sometimes he just spoke a word. It'll be as you said, go home, your daughter's, the demon's gone. Just go home, you'll find her. He used words of knowledge. In other words, he would understand, he would discern the demons and he would speak to it. And he, and he did it that way. He persevered. In other words, there was a perseverance. Like he, he touched this guy in Mark. You see anything? Yeah, sort of. Touched him again. So there was a perseverance. There was a progressive part to his healing. Um. He leaked. I like to, I just wrote it this way. He leaked. In other words, people just wanted to touch him. Uh, Peter with the anointing on him, his shadow just leaked. They just wanted to touch the shadow, right? So there's that leak thing, like the woman that touched Jesus with the issue of blood. And he used what I'm going to call, and I have it here on your big screen, faith triggers. In other words, by, by speaking the language of the deaf, mute man, by touching his ears, spitting on his tongue, and then here in John, we're going to see another instance where he spits on the ground and he forms mud from the clay and he puts that on the guy's eyes and then says, progressive healing. Now go wash in a pool of Siloam. We're going to look at it right here. All right. So why? I, I'm, I'm a Bible student. I'm not, I'm not the greatest wordsmith. I bumble and fumble and I've had my challenges with, uh, with a lot of stuff. And, and you guys know that. You've been gracious with me. But I'm called, and I feel the anointing. So I want you to just think with me on this. Now, if we go to John chapter 9, this is not a parallel account. In other words, this is not a, uh, an account by John of the same healing. It's different, different place, and uh, in other words, different location. John is in Jerusalem. They were in Caesarea Philippi on the other one, and or Basadia, and... Um, and so I want you to just connect these dots. Now watch this. Let's look at John 9. As he passed by, verse 1, he saw a man blind from birth. In other words, the crowds brought him some. That's another thing to point out. Uh, some came to him like the woman. And here he's just passing by and he sees this guy sitting over there. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, so that guy over there is blind, right? So who sinned? This man or his parents said he would be born blind. In other words, you got a problem, so what's your sin, right? Okay, that still happens today. All right, look at verse 3. Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned or his parents, nor his parents, 
but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. In other words, DNA, he's born blind, it wasn't sin, it's just the way it is, but you know what? It's going to be for God's glory because I see him now and I'm going to heal him. That's what Jesus is saying. All right, now, just with all the other healings we've seen so far, and I want to stick to the book of Mark, there's a need, there's a, there's a demographic location. Jesus is kind of being specific. Sometimes he just speaks a word, go, it is as you wish. Sometimes it's, he just uh, touches them. Uh, remember with the guy who lowered through the roof? He said, son, your sins are forgiven. Rise up and get your mat. Boom, right? Okay, so here it also is going to be um, progressive. Now, let's take a look. Let's jump down to verse 6. When he had said this, he spat on the ground, and he made clay of the spittle and applied it, the clay to this man's eyes. Happens along him on the road. The disciples say, who is this guy? What, what was the sin, man? Was it his or his parents? Nah, watch this. Just to prove the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All right. He said this, he spat on the ground, he made clay of the spittle and applied it, the clay to the man's eyes. Then he tells the guy, here it ends, progressive, spit, common denominator, now clay, tells him, now go wash in a pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So in a way in Washington, he came back seeing. Now, in all of these situations, I want to go a little extra biblical here, according to George. You can see a pattern. Jesus is ministering to common needs, blindness, sickness, demonic uh, possession, leprosy, whatever it is. But he's there's an application here that is personal at times. I call them faith triggers. Sometimes you just need the attention. Sometimes you need a personal touch. Sometimes, and I can't, I don't know, the, the gospel writers don't say this, but sometimes Jesus being omniscient God, he knows what that trigger is in that guy that's going to build faith for healing. And, and again, it's not the amount of faith. You have faith as small as a mustard seed, right? But there's this dynamic. There's this personal touch. And that's what's amazing to me about Jesus, okay? I don't have to know why he does this this way or this that way. I just need to know that he does it, and, and it's just the way it is. He just loves us so much. He knows every person so individually that he will take the time, take them aside, or just speak the word, whatever that person needs at that moment, wherever they are, to get the job done as the Son of Man. It's just amazing to me. Now watch this. If you think about that, again now, Mark 8, he spits, it's progressive. Then lays hands on him. He sees the trees, lays hands on him again. Two part. Here in John, spits on the ground, makes clay, puts it on his eyes. Two part. Now go wash. He goes and washes. In both cases, the common denominator is spit or spittle. I just call it spit. Y'all city folks can call it spittle. I call it spit. All right, here we go. Both men are healed. But, but bo in both of these circumstances, now if we just narrow it back to Mark 8 and John 9, both these guys are healed, but both healings are kind of connected to their personal need. But I want you to see this also location. Location. Now, the blind man in Mark's gospel was from the region of Bethsaida on the north end of the Sea of Galilee. That's where Mark's guy was. John... This healing is in Jerusalem on their home turf. I want you to write that down or get that into your spirit. This blind guy with the clay is on the Jews' home turf. And so out of the blue, Jesus spits on the ground and uses clay. Now remember this. He's God. And I showed you through this whole list. Look at this. I showed you through this whole list of things here. He, doesn't, he can do it anyway. All he has to do is just speak to it, right? All he has to do is just speak to it, but he uses these different methods. All right, so as a Bible student, I'm going like, so what's with the spit, right? Now, let me show you something. you got to dig a little deeper in a well to figure this out. So here's what we know. According to Levitical law, it talks about uncleanliness. Let me just give you one little snapshot here in, in Leviticus 15, verse 2. It says in there, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when any man has a discharge from his body, 
his discharge is unclean. Now, we know the lepers were unclean, and they had all this Levitical law that, that, that you know, uh, and Jesus told the lepers when he healed them, now go to the priest and present yourself according to the law so that they'll pronounce you clean. All right, now, so there was a Levitical law that said this, a discharge from a person makes that person unclean, and here's what we know, if you were to touch that person, you become unclean. So by Jesus, in all these healings, you can apply this to everything. Whenever Jesus walks up and touches anyone who's unclean, demonic possessed, a leper, someone who's blind, when Jesus touches a man's eyes and the, I don't want to get too graphic, but let's just say the, the crusty kind of pussy, I'm going to say it, discharge, Jesus under Levitical law would have become unclean and the leprosy would have jumped on him or the uncleanliness and then he had to go and Leviticus 15, if you read it all the way out, would tell you how to go bathe and wash and do all this stuff and you're unclean until nighttime, whatever it is. Now, just get the fact. What Jesus is doing by touching people is saying this without saying it. Look, I am above your Levitical law because when I touch him, it doesn't come towards me. My power goes towards him, and he's healed. Get a hold of that. Get a hold of that. In other words, by touching anyone and the result being healing, Jesus in both cases, Mark's account here in John, is not only demonstrating he was above the Levitical law, but but literally what he's saying is he's demonstration that, demonstrating that he was a higher spiritual authority than their Levitical law or the disease that the law spoke to and that his vision, mission, method, and authority, get that get that in your spirit. You're going to have that memorized before we get out of Mark, that his vision, mission, method, and authority has transcended their Mosaic laws. Why? Because he was above them. He was above them. Now, here's another powerful, interesting fact that we're going to put together, all right? According to some rabbis, saliva was regarded as having healing properties from only a select group of people. And guess who that select group of people were? Listen to what I found in the Talmud. Okay, The body of Jewish civil and ceremonial law and legend comprising of the Mishna and the Gemara. Okay, this is how this works. Um, just listen to this commentary. It's, it's Barba Barviza 126b. Can't pronounce it, doesn't matter. It's truth. Just listen to it. In Tomic society, according to Jewish tradition, the saliva of a firstborn of a father heals, but not the firstborn of a woman. What are we to make of the claims that saliva heals, but only if it heals, but only if it's the saliva of the firstborn? It's a rhetorical question, but Jesus was the firstborn of the Father. So you got a couple of things going on here. You have spittle. Now, was Jesus using spit to demonstrate by Levitical law to his own Jewish people that not only... Am I firstborn of a heavenly father and there's power in the spit? Now, again, be careful with this, but just think it through. He didn't need to spit, but he did because other times he just spoke to it. He was God. So why spit in clay? Think of it. Okay. Why spit? Ears. Why spit in hands? Okay. I think he silently demonstrating right into their own law something that they held to and that there was a healing power in the firstborn of the Father. Jesus was the first begotten of the Father. Look at John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, only begotten Son, firstborn and only, but have eternal life. It's amazing to me. Have you ever thought of that before? What's up with the spit? Well, now you know. Now, let's assume 
that is the connective point. Let's assume that's why. And a lot of commentaries will claim that. The rabbis will claim that, all right? But we know this. We know that by touching, okay? We know that by touching the unclean, rather than the uncleanliness coming to him, he was imparting healing to them, so he was above the Levitical law and priesthood of his day, right? And had power and authority over that Mosaic law. All right, now, why clay? This is this is a powerful thought, and I'm almost done. So why clay? Why spit in clay? All right. If he's spitting as the firstborn, where is he in John 9? He's in Jerusalem. He's on their home turf. So what does he do? He takes... The dirt that the Jews themselves claimed as the motherland, their home. He's in Jerusalem. He takes that dirt and he spits and he makes a ball of clay, puts it on the man's eyes, and then tells him to go down to the pool of Shalom and wash. And the guy was healed. Now, I was blessed uh, some years ago to get in before all the electronic stuff was going on. Uh, the Complete Biblical Library is a big hard copy, hardbound uh, commentary series that takes up two whole racks, big. And it has a uh, Greek and Hebrew index and a bunch of really cool things in it. And I got in early on that. And uh, I prepaid. And then as they actually wrote them, they would send them to me. And it took a couple of years for me to get that commentary series. I still treasure that. I value that. Another one that I got in on early was a... I, um, out of the same uh, company affiliate was a commentary that only recorded, that went through the, the Old and New Testament, but gave commentary from the forefathers only. In other words, there wasn't any modern commentary input in it. Now, one guy was Irenaeus, or Irenaeus actually is how it's pronounced. Irenaeus was a um, second century. He lived 130 to 202 A.D., he was a second century Greek bishop. He was a Bible scholar. Man, he was close. Second century Bible scholar. And he, uh, he wrote uh, his role. He did a lot of expanding Christian communities and what is kind of now south of France in his time down there. And, and he's known for developing Christian theology by combating heresy and defining orthodoxy. Watch this. Listen to what Irenaeus said and commented on the clay in John 9. All right. Now, Irenaeus says this. The reason Jesus used his spit and clay to heal the blind man while in Jerusalem on the Jews' home turf. Remember, that's what I said. I'm connecting that. All right was to connect him not only as the firstborn of the father, spit, healing powers, according to the Jewish law, but also to demonstrate that he was a higher spiritual authority than the Levitical law and or whatever disease. Remember, when he touched someone unclean, uncleanliness didn't come towards him, but the power of God went towards them and they were healed, right? And most importantly... By mixing spit, firstborn of the father, with the clay in Jerusalem. Come on, somebody. He was linking, he was connecting his account. He was connecting himself to the crea creation account as the word of God in the beginning who formed the first Adam out of the dirt of the ground. Bam. That's amazing. So what is Jesus saying? You see that man over there, they said? Who sinned, him or his parents? Nobody. But that sickness is going to glorify God. On the home turf, as people are watching, Jesus spits, makes clay, connecting himself as the firstborn, only begotten of the Father, the clay taking the dust of ground and forming a miracle for the man. There were no healing properties in the spit and the clay per se, but it's a demonstration 
I am the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God in the beginning, according to what John said in John 1. I am the Word from the beginning who formed man out of the dust. I have come to earth as the Son of Man, the Son of God. I am now going to show you that as the firstborn, and I spit on this clay, and I put it on his eyes, I will heal this one person as a son of God, and one day implied, when my blood drips on the same ground, I will in fact heal the entire world through my sacrifice on the cross. Right here in this one account, Jesus is telling you a multitude of things. And please, I'm going to close with this. He's showing you he cares. He's showing you that you're not a VIP sinner. doesn't matter what your condition is or where you are. Whether you blame, you end up ended up the way you are because of your parents or anybody else. He said that when he answered the disciples. No one sinned here. It's just a, just a reality of DNA or the culture of the world or whatever. All right? Fallen, fallen humanity. I am the firstborn of the Father. I was with the Father. I am the only begotten of the Son, as it says in John 3.16. I'm going to take this dust of this homeland that you claim, that you've laid all of your Levitical priesthood and laws on and your holy city, and I'm going to take that dust that you're trampling under, just as you're trampling over me, and I'm going to show you through my spit and this clay that I was in the beginning. I was there when man was formed out of the ground. I have the power and authority over your law to heal this one man right now because I love him and I care for him and it's going to demonstrate the kingdom of God that's at hand and one day, think about it, one day I will go to that cross and I will shed my blood and that dry ground is going to lick that blood up again and I will heal the world. I will deliver them and I will heal the world. They will be forgiven of their sins. The old covenant will be closed and the new covenant will be inaugurated all in one little narrative. Now, let me encourage you if you're listening at home, okay? I don't know where you are, but look, I don't want anybody to watch a video for the sake of critiquing my clothes or the sound quality or just amusement. I want you to be transformed by the power of God. How long have you thought about Jesus and never accepted him? You've never understood how he'll, what he'll do, why he does what he does. He does it so that you can have eternal life. He does it uniquely. He does it uniquely in different demographics, he'll, demographical locations. He'll do it uniquely right now in your room. If you just stop and pray this prayer with me, it's just like Jesus passing by and saying, hey, and he'll take you aside and he'll listen to you. Only God can do that. And he will forgive you your sins and he'll cleanse you of all your unrighteousness. And your name will be written in that Lamb's Book of Life. If you want that, if you want that, let's pray. Father, right now, we just confess our sins. Lord, we, you are faithful. You are just. That's all scripture. You will forgive our sins. And if we confess with our mouth that you are Lord and we believe it in our heart, we will be saved. And that anointing will go out and will save others through that great commission of go and make disciples. Lord, I'm not going to worry about tomorrow. I'm not going to worry about what it means other than this moment. I'm going to stay in the moment. Pastor George has shown us, demonstrated the love of God, the power of God, the deity of God, and his pathway to the cross. And right now I accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Jesus, forgive me my sins and cleanse me. Write my name in that Lamb's Book of Life. Right now. And it is, according to my words and my prayer, done to me according to Scripture right now in Jesus' name. Whoa, come on, if you just prayed that, get a hold of somebody, tell somebody, text me, call me, call the church, come to, come to church on Sunday at 1030. We're outdoors distancing in the tube. If it's raining, we're in the big Christmas Island tube, social distance, come on. Um, let us help you. We want to help you in your salvation walk. We want to help you get a hold of Jesus. If you want to give, uh, and I want to pray for the offering right now, if you want to give your tithes and offerings or to missions, if you want to get, give to Matt Talman and that Open Arms International, um, I don't have their web page here. They're out of uh, 
Kenya, Africa, but Nat's here. He'll be here on the 29th of November live. Um, you can go to MaytownAG.com. You can designate your gift as a tithe, offering, missions, outreach, whatever you want to do. Let me just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray right now for our tithes and offerings. Bless the giver. Bless the gift. Bless us. Encourage us. Encourage us as we network through our faithful, sacrificial giving to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ in your holy name. Amen? Amen. Thanks for being gracious. God bless you all. Have a great rest of your Sunday.